You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with September's first feast day quick take, starting with a pretty neat outtake from a letter written in 1858. Quote, They have sent me as curate, a young priest, with orders to mold him to the duties of pastor. In fact, however, the contrary is true. He is so zealous, so full of good sense and other precious gifts, that it is I who can learn much from him. Some day or other he will wear the mitre. Of that I am sure. After that, who knows? End quote. These words, written by Father Constantine of his young assistant, Father Giuseppe Sarto, proved prophetic. The eight years he spent as curate or assistant pastor in his first parish assignment at Tombolo, a small poor parish in Tolentino, Italy, were a proving ground, a pattern for the rest of his life. Ordained a priest in 1850 at the age of 23, and filled with the energy of youth and a spirit of humble piety, he wasted no time in fulfilling the lifelong vocation encapsulated in his well-known rally cry to restore all things in Christ. Dedicated to the conviction that devotion meant little if the devotee didn't understand what he was doing, young Father Sarto opened his school for the general education of the adults in his very first parish to teach the illiterate to read and write, which would improve their ability to provide for themselves, but even more so would provide for their eternities by enlightening their minds with the truths of the faith. Later, as Pope, he wrote the encyclical Acerto Nimis on the teaching of Christian doctrine, which expounded upon this fundamental principle. The first words of his last will and testament were, quote, I was born poor, I lived poor, and I will die poor, end quote. This was not an exaggeration. He was born in the small town of Rees in the province of Treviso, Italy in 1835, the son of a cobbler, the middle child of nine children. If his pastor had not found the means to provide scholarships for young Giuseppe, the bright young student would likely not have received more than a grade school education. But God willed it. And Giuseppe, raised amongst the poor, never lost his empathy and love for the poor. Years later, when Father Sarto became pastor of his first parish in Salzano, which was 25 miles away from his home, two of his sisters accompanied him to take the job of housekeepers. And their brother's spirit of poverty and love of the poor just about drove them crazy, mind you, in a loving sisterly way. There was no way of knowing in the morning whether the food they thought was in the pantry would still be there at dinner time. Their good brother would give the coat off his back or the shoes off his feet to a needy stranger. Even the kitchen table wasn't safe from his generosity. What did he say to their grumbling, though? He met their exasperation with a twinkle in his eye. What could they say? They knew his generosity, his love for the poor, as the hands and feet of Christ. Later, by his own sacrifice, Bishop Sarto would raise the funds to install a tile floor in his parents' dirt floor home and rebuild the rickety stairs to the upper floor. A third order Franciscan, he lived the spirit of St. Francis and would do no less for any of the children of the church. The care of their hearts, bodies, and minds remained his chief hands-on concern in every parish he oversaw. From that first pastorate in Salzano at the age of 32, to his appointment as canon at the cathedral in Treviso at the age of 41, to his position as Bishop of Mantua in 1884 at the age of 49, then his elevation to Cardinal and Patriarch of Venice in 1893 when he was 58, and finally his election as successor to Peter in 1903 at the age of 68. Throughout his clerical life, Pope Pius X was a determined crusader against the religious indifference and secularism that had already infected the whole of Italy, and indeed the world. Even as a young curate, he saw it himself everywhere he went, in the richest and poorest of parishes, and with the wisdom of the saint we know he was, he attacked the infiltration of evil at its root, beginning with the reformation of the seminaries and following through into the education of the faithful. A champion against modernism, the experience, conviction, and character of Pope St. Pius X 
without a doubt placed him by the divine hand in the pontificate at a time of crucial need in the history of the Church. The events of Cardinal Sarto's election to the papacy are described by Father Van O.F.M. in his Lives of the Saints. Quote, On July 20th, 1903, the reign of Leo XIII came to a close, and the world mourned the death of a great pontiff. Cardinals from all over the world came to Rome for the conclave, which would elect the new pope, and it's again typical of Cardinal Sarto, that due to his many charities, he was short of funds necessary to make the trip. They were provided, but so sure was he that he would never be elected, that the problem was solved by the purchase of a return ticket to Venice. With the conclave in solemn session, the voting began, and with each successive ballot, Cardinal Sarto gained more votes. As his cause continued to gain strength, he all the more strongly pleaded that he was neither worthy nor capable enough for the office. When it was finally announced that he had gained sufficient votes to be elected, he bent his head, broke into tears, and whispered, Fiat voluntas tua, thy will be done. He accepted, took the name of Pius X, and on August 9, 1903, was crowned as Vicar of Christ on Earth. End quote. The following quote is taken from an anonymous witness, quote, the new pope emerged attired in white with the exception of red shoes. This was quite regular, but he also failed to remove the red cardinal socks, which were supposed to be replaced with the traditional white papal stockings. The secretary of the conclave, Monsignor Mary Delval, kneeling, then offered him the papal white cap amidst breathless silence. He did not follow the precedent created by Pope Leo, who declined to give his red cap to the master of ceremonies as a sign that he would soon be created a cardinal. But with a slight smile, Pius X took the white cap and placed it calmly on his own head. He then dropped the red one lightly on the head of Monsignor Mary Delval, amidst a murmur of approval. This was taken as a certain indication that the happy recipient was soon to be raised to the cardinalate. And as an aside, Cardinal Mary Delval is a story of holiness for another day. Back to the quote. As the new pontiff stepped from behind the altar, he seemed to be the embodiment of his holy office. His face was pale and clearly softened by emotion. He paused a moment as he came before the expectant cardinals, then seated himself on the throne to receive the first obedience. Then the Te Deum was intoned. At the close of this hymn of praise, Pius X rose, and in a voice at first tremulous but gradually becoming full and firm, administered the papal blessing to all of the members of the sacred college. End quote. In his first act as Pope, St. Pius X addressed his first encyclical, Ad Diem Illum Laetissimum, to the Universal Church on the 50th anniversary of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception proclaiming the theme of his pontificate and the goal of his life, instaurare omnia in Christo, to restore all things in Christ, with the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. In this encyclical, he called for renewed prayer, citing the importance of the Catholic Church in determining the safety of the world, recommending all recourse to the Blessed Mother, saying, quote, By means of the human nature Christ assumed from Mary, he became the Redeemer of men. Mary, carrying the Savior within her, also carried all those whose life was contained in the life of the Savior. Therefore, all the faithful united to Christ are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, from the womb of Mary, like a body united to its head. End quote. So like Christ committing his mother to St. John, and St. John to his mother, Pope St. Pius X reminds the Universal Church that we are just as much through Christ her own true children. Throughout his years as pontiff, Pope St. Pius X never failed to remind the world of its need to run to Mary. He said, quote, The rosary is the most beautiful and the most rich in graces of all prayers. It is the prayer that touches most the heart of the Mother of God. And if you wish peace to reign in your homes, recite the family rosary. 
Truly, he said, we are passing through disastrous times when we may well make our own the lamentation of the prophet, quote, there is no truth and there is no mercy and there is no knowledge of God in the land, unquote. Hosea chapter 4, verse 1. Yet in the midst of this tide of evil, the virgin most merciful rises before our eyes like a rainbow as the arbiter of peace between God and man. He also said, Let the storm rage and the sky darken, not for that shall we be dismayed. If we trust as we should in Mary, we shall recognize in her the virgin most powerful, who with the virginal foot did crush the head of the serpent. End quote. Pursuing always the final goal of returning all things to Christ, Pope Pius X turned his attention, as he'd always done, to the root of all influence in the church, the seminaries, that same institution within the church that the devil and his henchmen, the Freemasons, knew to infiltrate first in order to destroy all the good work of this last sainted pope. We can list under the accomplishments of Pope St. Pius X the development of sanctioned Catholic action societies to counter the political action movements around the world. He reaffirmed in his encyclical Il Fermo Proposito the importance of prayer, but also of Catholics' involvement in their community affairs in order to promote Christian morality worldwide. He decreed that Sunday Catechism, taught by carefully trained instructors, be mandatory in every Catholic church throughout the world, and always ready to provide the example, he himself taught catechism to the people every Sunday in the Vatican courtyards. Anxious to increase reception of the Blessed Sacrament and provide for the faithful the opportunity for its subsequent grace, Pope St. Pius X eased the regulations that had discouraged daily communion. He lowered the age required for the reception of the Holy Eucharist, and he relaxed the required fast for the sick thus earning the title Pope of the Eucharist. In his encyclical Moto Proprio, or The Restoration of Church Music, he clearly delineated the highest form of music appropriate for divine worship, Gregorian chant, and promoted it as the highest ideal for use during the Mass. He reformed the breviary and the Missal, he initiated and closely supervised the construction of the Code of Canon Law, and perhaps most famously, amongst traditional Catholics anyway, he issued no less than 14 pronouncements against modernism, the synthesis of all heresy, the subtle philosophy that pretends to modernize the church to keep pace with modern times, but which in reality has proven to be exactly what this Pope warned, the destruction of the very foundation of the faith. His encyclical Pascende Dominici Gregis, which means literally tending the flock of our Lord, treated on the doctrines of the modernists. In Pascendi, Pope St. Pius X not only gave us a complete explanation of the errors of modernism and their causes, but provided the solution for this great evil, complete with preventative measures. But it all ended up being perhaps too little too late. The instrument of healing was worthy and good, but the body had already been badly infected. The infiltration of the seminaries had already begun, and the weakening of the spiritual lives of Catholics by the distractions and temptations of the modern era opened the door to the subsequent destruction of the Church and of mankind, just as Pope St. Pius warned would happen. In his encyclical, Il Fermo Proposito, on Catholic action, he told us, quote, To restore all things in Christ has ever been the Church's motto, and it is especially ours in the perilous times in which we live. To restore all things, not in any fashion, but in Christ, quote, that are in heaven and on earth in him, adds the apostle. To restore in Christ not only what depends on the divine mission of the church to conduct souls to God, but also, as we have explained, that which flows spontaneously from this divine mission, namely, Christian civilization in each and every one of the elements which compose it. To dwell only on this last part of the Restoration 
you see well what support is given to the church by those chosen bands of Catholics whose aim is to unite all their forces in order to combat anti-Christian civilizations by every just and lawful means, and to repair in every way the grievous disorders which flow from it, to reinstate Jesus Christ in the family, the school, and society, to re-establish the principle that human authority represents that of God, to take intimately to heart the interests of the people, especially those of the working and agricultural classes, not only by the inculcation of religion, the only true source of comfort in the sorrows of life, but also by striving to dry their tears, to soothe their sufferings, and by wise measures to improve their economic condition to endeavor consequently to make public laws conformable to justice, to amend or suppress those which are not so, and finally, with a true Catholic spirit, to defend and support the rights of God in everything and the no less sacred laws of the Church. End quote. This is the solution. End quote. The true friends of the Church, Pope St. Pius said, are neither revolutionaries nor innovators, but traditionalists. End quote. Something which I think is becoming abundantly clear to anyone with their eyes open and a true love for God and his church. St. Pius X's diagnosis of the modernist disease is as spot on today as it was 108 years ago. His prognosis has proven to be prophetic, but his prescription has been untried or at the very least sabotaged, but worth trying again. It's said that Pope Pius X was challenged by some of his advisors in the Vatican, who wished him to reconsider his condemnation of the modernist heresy, suggesting that, with the world already in an uproar, should he not approach the issue in a more conciliatory manner? And what was the Pope's famous reply? Quote, you want them to be treated with oil, soap, and caresses, but they should be beaten with fists. In a duel, you don't count or measure the blows. You strike as you can. End quote. In our world, the full fruit of the modernist religion, where truth and conviction of any kind have been so weakened by the wiles of the devil and the nature of man fallen almost to its lowest point, isn't it a breath of fresh air to hear the words of a father trying to protect his children? Pope St. Pius X, unflinching defender of the faith, died in 1914 in his 79th year. His death has been attributed to both influenza and to a heart attack, but many believe he actually died of a broken heart, having seen the start of the First World War and perhaps having insight to the imminent downward spiral of the church, and by it the loss of the salvation of so many souls. He is the last legitimately canonized pope, having been raised to the calendar of the saints by Pope Pius XII on the 29th of May, 1954. He is the patron saint of First Holy Communicants, and by popular acclaim, one of the champions of traditional Catholicism throughout the world. Pope St. Pius X, pray for us. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. You've been listening to the Catholic Family Podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends and family. You can support the production on Patreon and PayPal, and you can reach Kevin at kevin89davis at gmail.com. Ad maiorem de gloria. All for the greater glory of God.